good night everybody and tonight's story is called Kathmandu by Yellow Bus and it's written by Evelyn Conlon. An odd dangerous frisson happens before diving into the memory pool. People could break their necks if they accidentally hit the shallow end which may have become so not because little happened but because you've deliberately cleared out that end and left only a shimmering happily dishonest image. But here Let's risk it. Let's dip. In 1972, I went by ship to Australia. In 1975, I came back by bus. The ship was a thing, but the bus, now the bus, that was another matter entirely. I can still see the travel agent's window with the ad for the Sundowners Overland Tour, Kathmandu to London, who could resist? Well, as it turns out, many people, and for good reason. The journey began with a hop to Singapore from Sydney, a mere nine hour flight, where travellers were met with notices portraying precise hair lengths considered suitable for men. Barbers at the airport could insist on giving a trim to those not complying. In the post office, a hairy man could be forced to the end of the queue, the signs clearly stating that Men with long hair will be served last, so you could technically spend forever getting a stamp. This attention to appearance did nothing to prepare us for arriving in Kathmandu, where the plane came in over the Himalayas, dropped from the sky like a hawk in a hurry, the pilot hitting the brakes, shuddering every bit of the machine and us, before we emerged into golden dust and a land where the men wore miniskirts. On the morning that we assembled to board the yellow bus, we were a cheerful lot, except those whose turn it was to be sick that day. We peered at Vern, our Canadian guide, who had done this journey before and knew things we didn't know about travelling through Asia and the Soviet Union. On the unair conditioned bus, without the help of bottled water, if he had told us we wouldn't have believed him. From then on, diligently every night, he wrote out on a lined A4 notebook what we would see the following day. For the next three months, this grail, this prehistoric Google, was passed around and read avidly by us each morning, sometimes over one another's shoulders, such was the excitement. Before the camping month, we stayed in cheap hotels occasionally choosing slightly better so we could wash clothes, have showers and drink perhaps less dangerous water. In no time at all, we were in a world all on our own. At Pokhara, we saw the peaks of the Annapurna Massif as we made the spectacular climb through the Himalayas, stopping occasionally in villages, always in search of a drink. Coca-Cola was the most available, Coming across roadside stalls, we often drank a bottle in one mouthful. We couldn't imagine the invention of bottled water, and if we had done so, it might have driven us mad. All these years later, India can be summoned into one great cacophony of days out of a not yet written Rohingtan mystery novel. The Stringanar Lakes boatman, who kept a pot of coal below his cape, to keep himself warm comes to mind, as does the sight of our crock of a vehicle on the road from Pakistan to Afghanistan, chugging over the Hindu Kush mountains through Landi Kotal, where if you had the nerve to walk around the streets, we were told you could buy smuggled anything from anywhere in the world. We took the old Silk Road, crossed the Khyber Pass and the Kabul Gorge, we stopped and had tea with beautiful Afghani nomads in their tents, all of them wearing the most spectacular colours of red and blue, the men holding children in their arms, the women smiling at us strange blanched people, the camels snorting and looking sideways out of their big eyes at the yellow bus. Years later I saw pictures of Harash being destroyed and remembered going to a theatre there in a horse-drawn local taxi, the horse sp sporting red plumes, the hot night air full of magic. In Iran, 
I remember roses and roses and roses and the blue of if is Fahan where Omar Khayyam lived and the sound of a street full of artisans chipping out designs on lamps, tables and all sorts of ornaments. Sometimes when I get the chance to sit on a hot stone or wall I remember Persepolis. Four countries later we entered Ceausescu's Romania making our way to central Bucharest in that year still called the little Paris of the East. We saw the seven square kilometres of city that would soon be demolished to pander to his grandiose obsessiveness. In a bookshop in Kishinev, I looked for poems by Anna Akhmatova and Marina Tsertavia. Cheeky enough now when I think about it. I didn't find them. But I bought the selected works of Alexander Pushkin in two volumes, one poetry, one prose. I still have them with the price sticker intact. Looking at that sticker last week, I did indeed understand the danger of this memory diving, bearing in mind that danger has its good moments. The journey from Kathmandu to London took three months. We arrived an hour later than the advertised time. It took me years to get on a bus. I still look at tours going past and say to anyone who will listen, Oh look, that bus has air conditioning. But I will never forget the travel agent's window. Good night everybody and stay safe.